Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this message from the Roots Community Church. Our prayer is always that God will use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. And if you're new here, consider subscribing to keep up with all of our great content. Thanks again for checking out this message. We pray it's a blessing to you. We are in a series called Romans. Um, We're not very creative. We're literally just going through the book of Romans. So we called it that. Um, And we are today, if this is your first time, welcome and turn to chapter 3 in Romans. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. Some of you have an app on your phone, you could do that. Also, if you don't own a Bible, we've got quite a few of them out in the lobby. We'd love to just give you one um, and say thanks for being here today. Uh, Or we'll give you suggestions on good Bibles that you could purchase. That'd be awesome. But if you have one, go to Romans chapter 3. Let me lay a quick foundation of what we're jumping into today. So this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul, the greatest evangelist of his day, and one of the greatest probably ever is pretty arguable, um, and that, that he pushed forth the gospel in mighty ways, traveling all around, telling people about Jesus, starting churches, discipling young leaders, sending them out to start churches. Just an amazing guy. And here, he's writing a letter to a church in Rome. The church in Rome that he's never been to, he'll go to in about three years, but he wants to send them a letter about who he is, what he's about, who God is, what that means. And so he starts that way. Hi, I'm Paul. This is who I am. This is the gospel that I preach. Here's why it's important. In fact, we see in chapter one, you don't have to turn there. It also won't be on your screen, but you can write it down. If you, don't, if you don't trust me, turn there. Romans 1, verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So Paul lays out the gospel, and then he starts going, doing this work for several chapters of letting us know how bad every single one of us needs the power of God for salvation how desperate we all are to have a Savior and that that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. And so what we've been doing is kind of working through, it's kind of a rough few weeks as Paul unpacks that every single person needs a Savior, that everybody has wrath coming their way apart from putting their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. That the wage of sin is death, and that death is on us, the sinners. And that the only way that that is appeased, that that is dealt with, that we are forgiven, is to put in our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But he really wants to make sure that nobody feels like they can turn off and pass this, this, this need for a Savior. And so what he told us was that everyone is without excuse. It doesn't matter what kind of house you grew up in, where you started in life. Just by walking outside and seeing the beauty of creation, we are built to understand that there is a creator. He's greater than us, and we should bow before him and worship him. And that should drive us to looking to who is this God and seeking after the one true God. So he says that all of us are without excuse and that if we try to make excuses, what we're doing is suppressing the truth. We know that there's truth out there. We're suppressing it so that we can do whatever we want. And there's this scary thing that he says about God, God's wrath being poured out on those that suppress the truth and that he gives them over. One of the ways of God's wrath is to give them over to themself, yeah. to their ways. And that people have done some pretty horrific things as they have pushed away from God. He's given them over to their things and they've, they've done those. And all of us can look at the list of things that were listed and go like, yeah, that's really bad. And maybe I find myself in some of the categories. Maybe when God revealed himself to, to me, he found me in one of those spaces. And the next group he kind of goes after is, well, some of you guys see those. You judge those people because you know that it's wrong, but you do it yourself anyway. So maybe you're not as obviously bad, but you're like still wicked and you're piling up wrath for yourself for the day of God's judgment. Pretty scary statement. We should all own. It's in the Bible. And then last week, Bobby did a great job. My friend Bobby's one of the elders here at the church and and, um, he just preached through. Paul says, hey, 
to you that are Jews, that have the word, that boast that you're God's elect. And, and he kind of goes on this, that you call yourself an instructor, a guide, a teacher. How is it that you continue to do these things too? Like you think because you come from a certain line of people or because you've done certain religious duties and rituals that you're good with God, even though your heart remains wicked, it's much deeper than that. And so what we would say is it's more than just outward ritual. It's an internal circumcision, a heart being transformed. And, and without that, you are not God's people as much as anybody else. And so he drives that home. And today, what Paul does is an interesting thing. He, he uses this um, way to express his point where he forms a question that his opponents would have and then answers it without anybody standing there. And so he knows what the pushback is going to be and in some cases has already been to the truth of the gospel. And so he wants to kind of, uh, you know, in those days, it's not like today. Like today, if I send you a text message or an email, you can look at it today, send it back to me, and I, we can go back and forth all day. But when you send a letter to Rome, you need to kind of answer the questions up front. Right? Or they're going to send a question back, and you just wait for a whole piece of paper it's coming with a guy on a mule or something. And then you have to write it out, answer it back. So he's trying to get ahead of it. And so he's doing this question answer thing. In fact, sometimes it helps to think of that actually going on, presented in a way that Paul's talking to someone and someone's talking back to him, although he's speaking to the whole church and an idea. It, it helps you kind of work through the conversation. So we're in Romans 3 today. And I just want to let you know, sometimes there's some interesting text in scripture. It's good for us to work through those texts because I'm the type of pastor to continually push you back to your own Bible. And sometimes when you read your own Bible, you're going to find these texts and you're going to have to work through them. And I'd love for us to work through them together so that we grasp them well. We're confident in walking with the scripture in our own hands. So Romans 3, and if you're taking notes, write this down. Believe it or not, God is faithful. Whether you believe it or not, don't believe it. He's still faithful. Believe it. He's still faithful. That God remains. He remains Lord. He remains worthy of all honor, glory, praise, worship, regardless of if you give it to him or not. He's still glorious, amazing, awe-inspiring, wonderful, powerful, sovereign. Believe it or not, God is faithful. This is what I want to do. I'm going to read through the text, verse 1 through 8 of chapter 3. When I'm done reading, we'll spend the rest of our time just talking about those eight verses, and then we'll send you home to the sunshine. I shouldn't promise that in Washington. It might be anything by the time you leave here. I'll just, I will send you home. I don't know if there'll be sunshine. Here we go. What advantage, then, is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I am using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. Okay, the interesting thing that I get to do today, um, context is a big deal. And what I, what I mean when I say that is, we need to understand the context of Scripture. What, who is Paul? Who is he writing to? Why does this matter? Also, I get to do some work today to help us understand how this applies to the context of our life. Because some of you just heard me read that, followed along with me, and went like, yeah, but I got real stuff going on. How does this help? That's, the, that's my job. My job is, is to help us work through Scripture and see what does God mean by this, and what do I do in view of what God says? All scriptures God breathed, alive, active, beneficial for all of us. So, first point, write it down. 
Having God's word is an advantage. I'll say it again. Having God's word is an advantage. First couple verses here say this. What advantage? What advantage then is there in being a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? So this is why he's saying it. Paul just unpacked. You think you're a Jew and you're going to be good because of that, but you're not because your heart's still wicked. You think you're circumcised, so you've done the right things. You have the sign of this covenant, but your heart is uncircumcised and still hard. So you have a problem. And so what the, he, he's thinking through what is their argument going to be. Like, well, then why be a Jew and why be circumcised? Like, is there any advantage? Why do we go through all this? And what he wants to say to them is that, that yes, you are God's elect people that from the beginning God decided to show who he is and reveal himself to you so that the whole world would know how great he is and what it looks like to follow after him. It's beautiful. It's still a great thing. Hmm. But it doesn't save you just because you come through that family line. It doesn't matter what house you grew up in or what religious hoop you jumped through. If you don't have a faith in God, a love for him, and are following after him, you're dead in your ritual. You're dead in your namesake. Hmm. So what advantage is there? What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. Put an exclamation point there. He wanted them to understand this. First of all, it really means chiefly, because he's not going to give us a whole list. He's only going to give us one, kind of one thing right now. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. He's talking about the entire Old Testament. He's talking about God's special revelation about himself and his will. That even if your heart isn't right, there's a blessing in being a Jew that you were taught this at a young age, that his word is inside of you, instilled in you, a seed planted inside that you should know better even if you're not doing better. Right. Hmm. It makes me think of, of like church membership. I know um, in our context, it's probably, you're not probably sitting here arguing about is there an advantage of being a Jew because I know many people in this room aren't Jewish. But what we need to think through is that what the principle of what he's talking about here is that as God's people, quote, end quote, that, that the church is God's people, but how many know that everybody that's a church member isn't saved? Just because your name is on a roster somewhere doesn't mean you've actually put a saving faith in Jesus Christ. I hope you have. I pray that you would. I'll, I'll ask you to today. Over and over and over again. But it doesn't mean that you are, even if you've done something like for us, you know, maybe baptism. You've done one of these things. It's a right thing. It's an obedience issue. You could do that piece of obedience and never have put your faith in Jesus Christ. You could dunk in water and still not be saved. Your outside might be a little more clean. But your heart is as wicked as you went down. And so there's an issue of dealing with the heart of it, dealing with the heart. So what's the, there is still advantage in being baptized. You're being obedient to God. You're proclaiming your faith in Jesus Christ. There is advantage of being in the church, being a church member. There's an advantage to walking this thing out with other believers. It's the right thing to do. God told us to do it, but it will not save you because you attended. The advantage comes in the fact that we have the word of God. There's an advantage. Even if you are a church member that does not believe, there's an advantage in you coming every week because you're going to be preach the gospel every single week. There's an advantage in being in a community group where people will look at you and go like, hey, man, that's kind of off base. Let's talk about who God is, what it means to follow him, and what's really going on. There's an advantage in, in I, I was thinking in looking at this text, church kids growing up in the church. I don't know how many of you grew up in the church, how many of you didn't. Praise God, he saves from far and near. Yeah. So some of you had no clue growing up that there even was a Jesus, that you needed a Savior, and that there, his name was Jesus. But God, when you were out in the world, uh, and, and this is like an awesome, awesome thing that God would, with no context for you, he would just invade. 
that, that you would be out in whatever the world has to offer, living whatever kind of life you were living, and that he would go like, nah, today right. is that day. Amen. And then some of us grew up in church, and it just, it just still had to do the same thing. It just looked a little different. Because we thought we were okay because we could get to Romans 3 faster than the next person when Pastor just said it. Like speed Bible, getting to the place in the Bible fastest doesn't get you in heaven. But there is an advantage. So when you were, whether you were born from, or, or you were saved from far or from near, how many would say if you were saved from, you don't have to raise your hand, this is just a question I'm asking myself, it's kind of like Paul's doing here. How many would say that if you're saved from far, you first come to church and you realize those that were saved from near, the kids that grew up in church and needed saved just as much as you did, but they grew up in church? But you were kind of jealous because like somebody would say a verse and they're like, yeah, I know that. And they'd find it real quick and they'd know where they were going. They knew the Bible stories. So pastors would say like, you guys know in the Old Testament when, and you're like, "Uh uh-uh. And the kid's like, yeah, let me tell you all about it. Or whoever it is, right? And and you would go like, oh man, this kind of kind of a bummer and the thing that's that's cool about it is you can change that for your generations moving forward and one of the beauties of it is that the reason that was kind of cool and the advantage that that they that there's there is that the church has the word like it is good for you to have the word told to you to have you learn it memorize it sit on it even before God grabs you that he would save you and then you would have some some context for that and be able to move forward with the grasp of scripture So to the Jews, he says, listen, there is an advantage, and the the greatest advantage is God has made you the custodians of his special revelation. He has given you the word, and so when you're a young kid, you have to memorize huge chunks of it, and some of you still hardened your heart and turned the other direction, but for some of you, you heard it enough that God used it to save you, and how awesome is it? It's so good to, to have all of us and our kids hear the gospel constantly because you can't save your kids I can't save my kids but my kid will have an advantage because I'm going to pray with them at night and read their bible with them and put them in the children's ministry where they're going to tell them about Jesus over and over and over and over and over so that the seeds are down low that even if they rebel and go into the ways of the world I'm believing that God will use what has been spoken into their lives to grab them and save them Having God's word is an advantage. It's an advantage. The benefit of having and knowing God's word. And he's trying to help them understand that that they had the original invite. They're the ones that should have known Jesus was coming, not everybody else. They, They have a savior. His name is Jesus. And praise God that it's first to the Jew, but also to the Gentile. Let's keep moving. I'm going to move to my, my full next point. God is faithful even when we are not. That's the amen spot if you were wondering. God is faithful even when we are not. Everybody in this room should go like, praise the Lord. Yes. How many times he continues to be him even when I'm a wreck? Paul will go on in the text. Say, so what if some were unfaithful? And what unfaithful there is, is um, without belief or without faith. It's not just by their actions, but they, they didn't believe. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all! Exclamation point. And the other translations for this are kind of cool. It's, may it never be, or God forbid, or by no means. He's emphasizing with the strongest language possible that this cannot happen. It does not happen. That if every single person does not believe, God's still God. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And that's good news. Yeah. Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. Every single one. Because the standard of truth is God. It's not the person next to you. And we tend to do that. We do that with everything. Like if we want to feel good, like, God, I can't, I can't be that bad, right? Because have you seen that person? That makes sense. 
That there would be a spot away from your love and only understanding your wrath for that person. But for me, I'm better than them and them and them and them and them. You're, wi- you're so self-righteous. <laughs> you're wicked. But we tend to do that. Our standard is those around us because we want to justify ourselves instead of understanding that we can only be justified by God through Christ. And since God is true, he is the center of it. He is the one that is holy. When, we, when, I, when I focus more on God's holiness, I realize that I fall way short. But if I just kind of think of holiness or think of myself and how holy I'm working on being holy, then I can start thinking I'm pretty holy. Wow. Not at all. Let God be true and he- every human being a liar. As it is written so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. What he's saying is God's faithful no matter what. And there's kind of two ways you need to understand this. One is those people are saying, like, hold on a second. I thought we were good because we're Jews. And he says, now as an individual, you have to actually believe in God and love him and go after him. You have to put your faith in Jesus the way that saves But as a people, as a nation, God has said, he has a promise to save his people. And so he says, even though they've been all over the place, God's still faithful. But he's righteous when he judges. And so in your wickedness, when you've gone astray or when you've gone wrong, he's going to be righteous and he's going to be just when he deals with you. He will prevail in his judgment. Hmm. This is actually a verse, excuse me, from Psalm 51. And Psalm of David. David, the king that they all looked to as a, a one that they wanted to come like David, with power and strength to, to set Israel free from any of the bondage of surrounding nations and peoples. And so they knew that through the line of David, they would have a savior. And so they always looked to David as this great one. And Paul says, Look, let me remind you a little bit of David and, and how that went. And so he, he goes to David has just committed adultery. King David committed adultery and then had that person's husband killed. It's wicked. So wicked. He's confronted by a prophet. And he realizes, like, what you're saying is true. And it breaks his heart. He realizes how far off he is. And so he has this confession and repentance in Psalm 51. And the the verse that Paul's referencing is verse 4 of Psalm 51. But I want to start in verse 1. And just read through verse 4. It says, have mercy on me. First off, mercy is undeserved forgiveness. David realizes what I have done, I have done. And for me to be forgiven is because you've decided to forgive me, not because I'm worthy of forgiveness. And that's why he says, oh God, according to your unfailing love. Thank God God is faithful. <laughs> According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge or prevail when you judge. Interesting statement there against you, you only have I sinned. Clearly we know that David at this point has sinned against other people. We know that when we sin, we sin against God. We also sin against other people. But what he's doing is understanding to the level in which he has inflicted, the, the level in which he has fallen, the level in which he has sinned. Who has he sinned against ultimately and who is ultimately the judge? And so he's not saying that he shouldn't go provide confession, repentance, ask for forgiveness, deal with areas of restitution if necessary. We should do those things against people that we have sinned against. But what he's saying is the ultimate place I need to turn first and understand most is falling on my face before God as I have sinned against him and cry out for his mercy and realize that you're asking for according to his unfailing love, his great compassion, not anything that you can provide on your own. And so when Paul references this, he's referencing where David understands, like, I need to be forgiven by you because I have sinned against you and you are right to judge me, but I'm asking for mercy. God is faithful. 
when we are not, and, and Paul wants us to understand that whether if we put our faith in Jesus, he's faithful to save us. If we rebel and deny the gospel, he's faithful to judge us. But that just because we decided to be faithful or not doesn't change that he's going to be faithful. And that he is faithful. And that he always has been. Let's keep moving in the text in Romans. And you should write this down. How you reveal God's glory matters. How you reveal God's glory matters. There's an interesting thing Paul's about to say. And he, he, he's confronting some of what people are saying about him because Paul brings a gospel of grace. Paul says it is by grace you have been saved through faith that you believe, you put your trust in the undeserved favor of God extended in Jesus Christ. And that's how you're saved, not by the family you came through or the religious rituals that you have performed. Well, that sounds great for somebody far off, but for those that depended on their self-righteousness or the religious ritual or the family they grew up in, and now they realize, like, I'm not saved by that, that's not something you want to have said because you liked the idea of being more holy than everybody else, and you've been trying to push them down. Jesus confronts it constantly with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. That they would puff themselves up and that they would be more holy than everybody, but inside they were wicked still. Hmm. And what he's going to confront is that as he said that you are saved by grace, others said, well, then doesn't that just mean we don't have to do anything then? Can't we just live however we want? It doesn't matter at all because Jesus is the one that saved us. And what they did is they tried to cheapen the beauty of the grace that Paul preached. To say that it was not a transformative gospel. Hmm. And, and the, really the, the accusation is antinomianism, which is disregard for God's law. Wow. It's that you would have grace extended, so live as reckless as you want. Now, the reason I made the point how you reveal God's glory matters is this. If if you rebel against God, you turn from him, and the wrath due for your sin falls on your head at that judgment, God is still glorified in the way that he is stronger and above all and judge of all things. That's not the way I want God to receive glory in my life. How you glorify God matters. How you bring him glory matters for you. He's going to be glorified no matter what. He's God. And so every knee will bow. Everybody will see like, Oh, right. either in an excitement of like, I'm so glad to be in the presence of my God or in a way that is like frightening because you realize that's who I rebelled against. That's who I denied. But every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Everyone will see. Yes. And so Paul deals with some of that issue that, that our job is not to show God's glory by contrast like if I'm more wicked, he looks more great. Wow. But our way to, to promote God's glory is by obedience. Okay. So let's look at the text. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust and bringing his wrath on us? I love what's about to happen right here. Paul says, I am using a human argument because he just wants to be clear. I'm an apostle. This isn't what I believe. He just needed to input this here or insert this here so that you knew, like, he would never say anything this crazy. Right. It's important to him. Like, he's writing. He's like, hold on. This is not a good argument. This is just a, a human argument. This isn't me as the apostle making this argument. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Can you go back there for a sec? So we need to, to just see here. He says, certainly not. It's heavy language again. By no means. 
And he's saying that everyone understands that God is the one that judges the world. Always. That's been an understanding, that God is the one that judges the world. And so what he's working through is people hear him speaking about grace, and they're saying it sounds like we can just live however we want, and if I'm just wicked or I lie and he's truthful or I break things and he heals things, like, isn't it just making a greater expanse so we can see how much greater God is? So if I'm super wicked, isn't it cool because it just shows how awesome God is and shouldn't I be off the hook? It's an interesting line of thought, but people can go there. And so that's one of the arguments that is happening. Like, hey, if, 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 I'm, if, if I make it dark enough in my life, won't his light be so much brighter? <laughs> Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? He says that's not the case. In fact, all of Scripture would say that that's not how it works. goes on. Someone might argue. If my falsehood, that's a lie, if I lie, enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? <laughs> why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, now check this out, Paul's kind of taking these ideas that he thinks might be said against what he's saying and, and, and debating kind of himself so that they can see truth play out. But here, this is a real thing that people have been saying against him. Wow. He's like, me and some, some of my guys, people are talking bad about us. Why not say some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Like, let me do wicked things so that you see that God is good. And how messed up that thought is. In fact, by that line of thought, you get things like, well, why is Judas held accountable for, for betraying Jesus? Didn't it lead to him going to the cross and dying for our sins so that all could be saved? Like, read what the Bible has to say about Judas. Like, it's better that he wasn't ever born. And how horrific it is to be him and like the, the, the guilt that, that came on him and how wrong it was and evil and, and that he'll be held accountable for selling out our savior but by this line of thinking you could go like judas should be good man because ultimately just because god can use it for his glory doesn't mean you're actively glorifying god praise god that he still does praise god that he is faithful and he still will use the, the stupid things we do sorry i was thinking of myself there that he will work through it in a way to ultimately glorify himself. But let us not be a people that live without obedience, live without following after him and live wicked lives only to say, yeah, but God will get glory in it anyways because the contrast of my darkness in his light. I need the worship team to come up. So why not say, as some slanderously claim, we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. What he's saying is those that say those types of things or make that kind of argument that I should be a greater liar. I want you to know the truth of God, so I'm going to be a greater liar. I want you to see his holiness, so I'm going to live in a, in a less holy way. How you promote or, or, or how... You reveal God's glory matters. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, Peter says it like this. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans or the unbelievers that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. His argument is fight the sinful desires, live good lives doing good things among those that don't believe so that they will glorify God because of you doing right things and following after God, not because of you being wicked. There is great advantage in having the word of God. 
God is faithful even when we aren't. And how you reveal God's glory matters. We're not saved because of us doing all the right things. Paul got into that before, right? He says it's not because you have all these things or you've done things like circumcision that you're good. But we definitely are saved to do good things. Did you hear me? It's not effort to get saved. It's because we understand the grace extended to us. We use our lives now to glorify him. Later on in the text, we'll see it. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, brothers and sisters, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable or spiritual act of worship. That it's a response thing. It's not to earn our righteousness, but it's because we've been saved, been made right, that we long to live a life with everything we have that would glorify him, that would worship him, that would point people to him. Yeah. Can you stand to your feet?